The first lesson today is from the book of Acts, first chapter, first 11 verses, uh, page 770 in your pew Bible, Acts 1, beginning at verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Our other New Testament lesson this morning is in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 16 through 23, found on page 827 in your pew Bible. <laughs> Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 16. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The gospel lesson is in the 24th chapter of Luke, which please rise for the reading of the gospel. Luke 24, verses 44 through 53, page 749 in your pew Bible. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what it is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Here ends the reading of the lessons. You may be seated. Today is Ascension Sunday when we commemorate the ascension of our Lord into heaven. 
one of the great events in the life of Christ. I do want to say a little bit about Mother's Day first, though. It's particularly about my own mother. I read one time that your mother is more with you after she's gone than while she's still on the earth, and I found that to be true. I think about her every day, and, and when she was still alive, when I could go and visit her, I didn't always think about her every day, but that's, that's true. But uh, one scripture verse that mom always drummed into us kids, there were several, Proverbs 22, verse 1, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Yeah, and that's one of the things I remember her by, and that, how, how true I found that to be. It's worth uh, way more to be held in, in high regard. And where does that come from? It comes from good character. And where does that come from? It comes from persevering in faith in Christ. And so... I'd like, just like to leave you with that thought also, which I got from my mom. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. And so, you know, one of the things throughout my life, my adult life at least, uh, is I wanted to act in such a way as to make my mom happy. And I think that's a good goal, but if that's true, how much more to act in such a way as to keep our Heavenly Father happy? And uh, certainly that's, that's what I wish. And then Luke 11, uh, the greatest, uh, or at least the most famous mother of all, Mary, uh, Jesus um, was once upon a time uh, uh, met by a man. He said, blessed is the woman who gave you birth and, and the, uh, she who nursed you. And he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And certainly my mom would have echoed that sentiment as well. Moving to the ascension, a lot of times, you know, ascension is that one event in the life of Christ that tends to get kind of lost in the shuffle. I mean, Christmas and the crucifixion and Easter, obviously, those are the big highlights. I mean, Jesus was born. He became a human being. He loved us enough to want to be one of us. And then at Good Friday, he died on the cross. He loved us enough to give his life for us so that we could live in heaven with him. And then rose again from the dead on Easter. And, and understandably, we, we recognize those particular days and, and really exalt them and we celebrate for all it's worth. And that's good. But those weren't the only things Jesus did. And, and part of the whole plan, when we think of Jesus' ministry on earth, we think of Jesus uh, preaching and doing miracles, dying on the cross, and raising from the third day. And that's, that's his ministry. But ascension is also part of his ministry, as was Pentecost. It's all part of the plan, and it's all part of what he came to do and what he, who he came to be. And so ascension is part of that calling of Christ uh, to this world for our sake. And I'd like to start with verse uh, Luke 24, verse 52. When Jesus ascended, while he was blessing them, well, 51 actually, while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And I always wondered about that verse. Here Jesus had been with them for some three and a half years. He poured himself into them and then he died and they were just absolutely heartbroken. They were um, terrified, I'm sure, of what might happen next. And then they were uh, lifted back up when he arose from the dead and they were happy and joyful and he was with them again, walking with them, eating with them, spending time with them. And then he left. And the Bible says they were filled with with great joy. How can that be? How could they have such joy when Jesus left their presence? Weren't they going to miss him? I mean, if I put myself in their place, I just can't imagine what a void I would think at least there would be in my life if, if I would have been with Jesus and then all of a sudden he's gone. In spite of his promises, Weren't they even a little bit doubtful that his going away would benefit them? The ascension 
must have been a sight to see. I mean, that must have rivaled many of his miracles or even surpassed them. We talk about, Don was talking about the power from on high, and Jesus exhibited that daily. But can you imagine you know, watching him go up in the sky and disappear from view? People just don't do that. And Jesus did it. And so that inspiration of seeing that, watching him leave in that fashion, might have uh, carried them along for a while, but, but great joy at his absence. I just have a hard time imagining that. Jesus told them in John 16, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. But that Jesus said, it's for your good that I go away. Quick now, when your parents told you something that's good for you, what comes to mind? Going to the dentist, eating your spinach, you know, all that stuff you didn't really want to do, but you knew you had to do it anyway. Practicing piano, you know, all that stuff that you just, all I wanted to do is go outside and play baseball. Everything else was unimportant to me. No, this is good for you. You have to do that. Or, or kind of like going on a diet. Is the food good for you or does it actually taste good? You know, we, don't, we can't put those two things together. Well, I believe, first of all, that the Holy Spirit was already, had already come upon the disciples in some measure. Otherwise, they could not possibly have had that joy. Even though the Bible says they were filled with the Spirit or baptized in the Spirit. Remember John the Baptist said, when the Messiah comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. But I believe they had some of that before uh, when Jesus ascended. But I also believe that if we examine the Scriptures to see what actually this Bible teaches about the ascension, then we'll understand better why the disciples had joy, why they rejoiced when Jesus left. And so let's just ask that question, why, why did Jesus ascend to heaven? First of all, it was part of God's plan from the beginning. Just as surely as his being born, just as surely as his dying on the cross and rising from the dead, it was also part of God's plan that he ascend into heaven. It wasn't an add-on for a job well done. But he was meant to raise up to heaven from all eternity. In Ephesians chapter 1, this time in verse 10, it says this, uh, verse 9, He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together, under one head, even Christ. Christ was meant to rule. He was meant to ascend to heaven. Hebrews 1, verse 3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. After He had provided pur purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And even in the Psalms it was foretold. In Psalm chapter 2. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. And also in Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And we can go on reciting all the verses where from the beginning of time it was ordained that Christ should rule on the throne of heaven. And this in itself is good news. It's part of the gospel to have a good and righteous king. Proverbs 28 verse 12 when the righteous triumph, there is great elation, but when the wicked rise to power, men go into hiding. We know that's true, even on an earthly scale. When leaders are good, nations are happy. When leadership is bad, 
when the you know we're under communist people are under communist rules or other totalitarian states when there's no freedom when leaders abuse their power when leaders are corrupt people are not happy how much more when Jesus takes the throne he's perfect he's the perfect king he's the perfect man because he's the lord when the righteous triumph, there is great elation. So when Jesus ascended to the throne of heaven, that gives us cause for rejoicing as well, even as it would the disciples. Secondly, why did Christ ascend? He ascended to the Father in order to pray for us. What a thought. How much comfort we get we're feeling bad. We ache. We lose someone to death. And we, we go to a friend, a loved one, and say, please pray for me. And they, that person will drop everything and pray with you, and you feel better. Can you imagine what if Jesus was with their, their praying with you? Well, he is. And we need to make that real to our our minds because he is praying for us and he does that all the time Hebrews uh, chapter 7 again in chapter Hebrew in Hebrews Jesus lives forever and has a permanent priesthood therefore verse 25 he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them he is right at the right hand of the father interceding for you right now. In Romans 8, verse 34, Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Can you imagine Jesus' prayers not being answered? I can't. What Jesus prays for the Father gives. He's praying for you. Won't God the Father answer His prayers on your behalf? This should fill us with joy every single day. Christ ascended to the Father to pray for us. Why did He ascend to heaven? Thirdly, Jesus ascended to heaven to prepare a place for us. We sang about it today. In John 14, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. We probably all have a picture in our minds of our dream house, what it would look like, how beautiful it would be. But the nicest mansion, the most luxurious suite we can think of in this world won't hold a candle to the place Jesus is preparing for us where the streets are gold. You know, we have all these jokes about the pearly gates and St. Peter you know, being the guardian and letting people in and all that. And that's kind of fun. But you know, in heaven, there's 12 gates to get into the city. And each gate is a single pearl. Rhonda's brother gave her a string of pearls, and I think we got, she got one from Grandma or somebody too. But you know, each they're they're kind of small; they're less than an inch, you know. But but they're worth kind of a lot. Pearls are not cheap if they're real pearls. Can you imagine a pearl big enough to you know fill a city gate? That's just one, and there's 12 of those things. And actually, you know, Peter doesn't have a gate. He's one of the foundation stones. The, the apostles, there's 12 stones that make foundation of the city of heaven. Each one is one of the apostles. So we we'll actually won't be going in St. Peter's gate. We'll be going in uh, Joseph's gate or Manasseh's gate or Ephraim's gate or, you know, somebody, you know, Judah's gate. Twelve foundation stones, twelve pearls. 
make the gates streets of gold. How wonderful will that place be? But the greatest attraction of all is who's going to be there. And it's great that all of, you know, all of us who believe will be there, but all the more God, the Lord Jesus. Yeah, we'll get to meet Elijah, we'll get to meet Moses, but Jesus is there. Oh, how I wished I could have been like the disciples and walked with Jesus and talked with him and ate with him. We got all eternity to do that. That's what's coming up. Love is what makes the house into a home. And heaven will be full of that. Jesus is preparing your place there. Make sure you have a one-way ticket to go there. That's why he ascended to heaven, to make a place for you. Why did Jesus ascend to heaven? He ascended to heaven so that he could send us the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we have neither life nor power. He sent his spirit, and we were created. He withdraws his spirit, and we die. I believe that by my own power or strength, I cannot believe in Christ or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has come. He calls and gathers, enlightens and sanctifies us, the whole Christian church on earth. God, the Holy Spirit, is life. John 16, 7, which I read earlier. Unless I go away, the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus had to go to send him to us. In Acts 2, 33, that great Pentecost sermon, which we'll hear more about next week, Peter said this, Exalted, Christ was exalted to the right hand of God, and he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Christ ascended to heaven so that we could have the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, we get to share in the life of Christ. With the Holy Spirit, we can live that abundant life that Christ has promised. Christ is present with us. Christ enables us to do the things that he did by the power of the Holy Spirit that he went to heaven to send to us. To. Why did Jesus ascend to heaven? He ascended to heaven partly, I think, to spur us into action. I mean, I, the disciples, they did a lot of good stuff, you know, and, and sometimes when they were with Jesus and every once in a while he'd send them out on a mission tour and they did things, and he told them to heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse the rep, lepers and preach the good news, and they did that. Then they came back to Jesus and they told him everything they did and they were happy about that. But still, Jesus was the main guy. They, they just followed him around for the most part. No more. Jesus is in heaven. Now it's our turn. It was their turn when, when the, it was the disciples' turn when Jesus ascended to heaven. It was, they weren't going to be following him physically around. They weren't going to be literally walking in his steps. They were it. We're now his hands and his feet. And I like the way Acts chapter 1 says it, the way Luke says it in Acts 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. His whole life on earth was just the beginning of his teaching. You know, he's still doing that. He's still healing people. He's still teaching people. He's still loving people in all those ways. But he's doing it through us. When he was walking on earth, he began to do and to teach. But now, he's still doing it, but he's doing it through us. In the words of his I am statements, I am the bread of life, he's still providing. But he does that a lot through us. 
I am the light of the world. He still gives wisdom and understanding through when we preach the gospel, through when we bring other people to him through the word. I am the good shepherd. He's still leading and guiding people. I am the door. I am the gate for the sheep. He's still bringing people into the kingdom. I am the resurrection and the life. He still gives people life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's still the proclaimer of truth, the Lord of our conscience. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He's still sustaining all things, but mostly the way he does all those things is through us, the church. He works through his word, through the Holy Spirit, and with us, as we're the kind of like the conduits of his grace, he pours out his grace on the world through us. And so the ascension was a clue. It's like, okay, church, now it's your turn. I've showed you what to do. I'm giving you the power. Now go and do it. In this way, by his ascension, Christ is still building his church. He said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Peter and the apostles are the foundation stones. But you know, there's a lot more to a wall. There's a lot more to a city. There's a lot more to a house than a foundation. The rest of the house is us. He's building it, but he's, and he's still doing that, but through us. Those five things, I think, you know, the disciples maybe wouldn't have listed it out just in that way, but, but they knew that Jesus leaving was really a new beginning of wonderful, great things. They knew the promise of heaven was at hand. They knew that all this had been planned from before, from eternity. And none of these things were possible as long as Christ remained with them on earth. But after the crucifixion, after Easter, after Christ's instruction to the disciples came the ascension, so that when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are sure that that prayer is being answered among us even today. And so may we also rejoice in our resurrected Lord, but our ascended Lord as well, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns in heaven with our Heavenly Father and with the Holy Spirit, and who invites us all into the kingdom of his love. Amen. Let's pray, uh, sing together the...